Respect is something we tried to instill in our children when they were young. It had to be not only taught, but it had to be shown in order to be earned. I had to learn it myself growing up, but I never learned it from my parents. I was 11 years old and it was a very harsh winter, so my father had his best friend move into our house for the winter because of the poor road conditions on the country roads. They put my older sister in my bedroom because her bedroom had two twin beds that he and I could use. One night I woke up and heard him and my mom in the other bed doing something. She saw me and told him to shut up and I lay down and went to sleep. She was right, so I did. The next day I asked her about it, she said it didn't happen, that I must have dreamed it. Two weeks later I caught them again, but this time in my parents' marital bed. The result of their relationship was my younger sister. My mother, to protect herself, made me the family liar. My father raised my half-sister as his own, but to numb the pain, he became addicted to whiskey. I learned quickly and firmly that for most people, the truth didn't matter. It mattered to me, and to this day I hate liars. I neither condoned them nor defended them. To many who knew me, it made me look like a complete ass at times. My only son experienced firsthand that not talking to me was the worst thing he could have done in his life. Talking to his mother turned small problems into big ones. If she got to me before he did, they became emergencies. His mother knew what buttons to push and it was a tough two years for him, but then he opened up to me. He realized that responsibility was a price he had to pay. He turned 16 this year and he wanted his first car. He was the oldest of three kids. My youngest brought home a bad winter cold, which she lovingly passed on to me, so I was awake, suffering coughing fits, switching TV channels looking for something worth watching, when I discovered a new version of the cameras used by police officers. Using my cell phone, I texted my friend, asking him if there were models that could automatically forward the current video when it became full to a pre-programmed email address. Two days later, he called and told me about a product that did just that, but it didn't cost as cheap and only worked as intended if you had free Wi-Fi. Three of these devices ended up costing me over 2000 I had him deliver them to my office at work along with a new laptop I had ordered for personal use. The advertising firm I worked for was responsible for supervising all commercial shoots, which meant I was often on remote locations for days at a time. The main shareholders of the firm were identical twin brothers. Their names were Robert and Stephen Walker. Stephen was known as a gambler and had never married. We seemed to get along very well. I had worked for them for many years and was now earning six figures, so life was going great for me. While I was away, if my wife needed an escort, Robert, who is gay, was the brother who stepped in. It gave him an opportunity to improve his public image. David Peters delivered them to me by showing up at my office on Friday afternoon with a few additional items for me to review. The first thing he said I needed to do was to set up an email address in the cloud to which the videos would be sent. So I created a new account just for that. The cameras were no bigger than a diamond stud. They are all motion activated, so he had one of them embedded in the earrings. They could run for up to a week before requiring recharging, which was done wirelessly when a signal was detected. All she had to do was remove them and put them back in the box. Each camcorder had its own ID number and she presented it to everything they sent. He asked me why I needed them. I explained that my intuition was telling me something was wrong, but I didn't know what. I wanted to see for myself if my stomach was wrong. Sunday night I was scheduled to fly out for another trip. On Sunday I presented Deborah, my wife of almost 18 years, with her gift. Diamond earrings that dangled down from a stud. She loved them and promised to wear them the whole time I was gone. Before heading to the airport, I stopped by the office to pick out a few necessities. This gave me the opportunity to leave a note in both of my boss's offices that I would call them if there was a problem. I installed one camera in each of their offices so that it would give an uninterrupted view of their desk. Both were directly connected to the sources they needed. I flew from New York to Whistler on the west coast of British Columbia because we had a two-week shoot scheduled for a new skiboard commercial. Fortunately, there was still snow on the upper peaks. I'm not a very large man, only 5 feet 9 inches, 166 pounds with a 32-inch waist. Deborah always says I should wear socks for boys 3 to 9. Her wrist was thicker than mine. We were both the same height, so around me. She never wore heels. She had a decent rack, but anything bigger than her mouth was beyond me. With her long blonde hair, she attracted the attention of many men, but always blew them away. Our life when I was home slowed down but was still fairly regular, and it seemed that our children took the example of her half of the family, so I had no reason to doubt it. 
as a precaution, and because we live in the city, we agreed to have our kids' DNA tested. We also fingerprinted them in case anything happened to them. On Wednesdays while I did karate, she went to the theater, and the rest of the time we spent all of our free time together. On Fridays we'd go out to dinner and dance because we both loved to dance. Weekends, when possible, we devoted to the kids. Deborah had her own home interior decorating company, which brought her a good income, and she had an answering service when she wasn't home. There were times when we were both loaded with work and were away from home. Both of our parents came to the rescue. As a result, our children developed deep relationships with both of them. On Monday evening, I started going through the information sent to me, sending daily updates on the laptop provided by the company. Then I opened mine and discovered three sent messages. The first one that caught my interest was a fight between Stephen and Robert. I've had enough, said Robert. Being your muse so you can entertain Deborah is no longer fun. God, if Glenn ever finds out we're screwed. He's doing the work for three, and without his abilities, we'll lose millions. Do you know how many clients we'll lose if he goes to our competitors? You've got to stop this now. I can't, said Stephen. I love her, and according to Deborah, their three children are mine. Jesus Christ. You're an idiot, said Robert. I'm going to our corporate lawyer to ask him what we should do to protect the firm. If the truth comes out, we're all screwed. Glenn will destroy us all and he'll have every right to do so. I went to the bathroom to throw up. I called my older cousin Gordon, an expensive divorce attorney, and got him out of bed. Let's just say he wasn't impressed when I told him what I had learned. He told me to send all the videotapes I had received to him and he would start taking action on his end. The first thing he wanted to arrange was to get a sample of Stephen Walker's DNA. The videotapes themselves couldn't be used, but the transcripts of the conversations could. He asked me to send a copy of my firm's human resources manual to his office. He asked me to find a notary public to fax him a power of attorney. Tomorrow I will get the private investigator we are working with involved in this case. They will find out when, where, and how. It's a good thing you're in Canada. If you're not around, things will be easier because their guard will be down. If all goes well, it would be a good idea to cater to them before you return. I replied that it should be in a little less than two weeks, but it could take longer. The next morning I called my assistant who handled everything I needed during the shoot. I asked her to forward the instructions to my cousin's QT office. Nora said she would do so and commented, I guess you finally found out. After answering yes, she said she would remain silent for now, but was willing to testify on my behalf if necessary. So management knew all along. I then stopped by the family doctor's office to explain that I needed to send copies of my children's DNA to the lawyers since I was drafting a new will. I charged the fee to my credit card. One of the Canadians working with us was able to get a notary. The rest of the week I just sent videos because I knew my cousin would explain everything. The rest of the week I spent the rest of my free time fighting with myself not to go to the gym and get drunk. I now understood my father's pain. On Friday afternoon, after arranging what I could do over the weekend, I flew to Vancouver by helicopter and then drove all night to New York. After renting a car, I parked it on the next street over from my house. I was surprised to see relatives picking up our three children. Half an hour later, Deborah came out, dressed in a brand new dress with high heels that skimmed her body like a silhouette. As soon as she left, I turned off my alarm clock and went into my office to pull out what I called 16 journals. They contained the dates of each trip, what happened, and where I was. Those logs had saved my ass more than once from a legal standpoint. An hour later, I was at Gordon's house, sitting in his kitchen discussing what he had learned. A DNA sample had been taken from Steve, and we were waiting for the comparative analysis to be completed. They had also discovered the penthouse that the two had owned for 22 years. The neighbors thought they were a civilian couple, and he had proof that they were both there so regularly that the neighbors thought they worked weekends and nights. Twice a week, they had a house cleaning company come to their house. He had an affidavit confirming that they were a civil couple even before we met. Her firm's only client was a limited liability company that sold and bought inexpensive apartment buildings, then remodeled them and sold them to new buyers at inflated prices as furnished apartments. This firm was wholly owned by Stephen Walker. The company's tax records showed that Deborah was making over half a million a year after expenses, but was extracting less than 80000 for herself. My children might not be mine, but were they Stephen's? That remained to be seen. Since Deborah was playing me, had she done the same to Stephen? Gordon told me that my mother would be picking up the kids next weekend because I wasn't expected home until at least Monday. 
We agreed to burn the bitch, her lover and company. When she was in her primary residence, their penthouse, I would take out of the house what I felt she should have. I told him I'd be flying in Friday night. He would cancel all the cards in both names and empty half of our accounts before they were frozen by court order the day I was coming home. I flew back to Canada to finish filming, working twice as hard. Robert Walker met me at the airport as I was getting off the plane Saturday morning. He was surprised that I had finished filming early and was confused because he couldn't understand why our meeting couldn't wait until Monday. I had the company laptop with me. Over a cup of coffee, we discussed the trip and what the editing department needed to do. While we were sitting there, a gentleman approached and asked if he was Robert Walker. Robert confirmed his identity and the man said you have been served. Before he could utter a word, I handed him my laptop, company keys, credit cards, and pulled a letter of resignation out of my jacket. Then I explained that his brother and my wife had also tendered their resignations. His face turned white and he asked how bad it was going to be. I replied that I was going to ram it down their throats. I have DNA that confirms Stephen is the biological father of all Deborah's children and mine. The lovers are being serviced in their penthouse right now. Remind them that they are required by court order to stay 500 feet away from my mother, children, and me. I felt like poor Robert was about to lose his last serving. I got up and started to leave. Robert pounced on me in a rage. Before airport security could get to us, he was lying on the floor with blood running down his face. He would no longer be a handsome boy were it not for the large medical expenses. My mom and kids met me as I drove into the house, opening the garage door. It was hard to inform my two daughters and their brother that I was not their biological father. My mom lost her temper when I told them that their mother was now with the man who had become their father in their love shack. I told them that their relationship lasts longer than your mom and I have been married. For now, you will live with me until the court rules after you all have been interviewed. The court will look at all three of your parents' relationships with you before making a decision. All three were devastated and so was I. My mom heard someone trying to unlock the door and went to open it. I said no, that the outside alarm was still on. So I called the police, explaining that I wasn't supposed to be home and that someone was trying to break in. They said they were already responding to the silent alarm. That's when I sent the kids upstairs. They managed to get the front door open. Stephen was kicking out a window in the massive metal door, putting his hand through the door and trying to unlock the chain lock when the police showed up. Having apprehended the intruders, the policeman knocked and identified himself. When I opened the door, I saw Stephen and Deborah in handcuffs sitting in the back of the cruiser. When he said she claimed to live here, I handed him a copy of the restraining order that had been served this morning. He smiled and said, I guess they're both going to jail until they meet with the judge. My mother finally admitted that what she did to me years ago was wrong. It took her seeing what I was doing to realize the real cost. Not me, but her grandchildren. I'm no better than Deborah, she said. Your father forgave me, but he was never the same. If he hadn't died in an industrial accident, I can't say we wouldn't be where you are now. Deborah and Steve's pictures were on the front page of the New York Post on Sunday morning as they were being led to the police station. I told the reporter on the court call the whole picture of what was going on. I stated that I was forced to resign from the firm because of Stephen's long-term relationship with my wife. This will be published in the press on Monday. The DNA comparison report between my children and the Walker brothers proved their parentage. She liked the fact that the president of Walker's adverting violated the moral high ground he had established by interfering in my marriage. It was up to the board of directors to decide the matter. Carl and Carla Matthews, my children and I, shared a late Sunday dinner at a local restaurant, after which they followed us into our home. Their grandmother put my daughters to bed so my father-in-law and I could talk in my home office. Dad, said I. Deborah and Steve's relationship started before I even met Deborah. I found out about their relationship when I was in Canada. I then showed him a video clip of Robert and Steve talking. He shook his head in amazement. It was clear to me that he had no clue about anything. I then showed him the purchase documents for the penthouse, which were two years earlier than the date of our marriage. The condo was still registered under her maiden name. Damn, Carl exclaimed. The day you got married, you were already an asshole. When I saw that clip, I hired a lawyer and a private investigator. Both said it was easy to get the facts on them because they thought they had protected themselves so well that the truth was impossible to find. I said softly, I'm not going to let what's going on in my life affect moms and your relationship with your children.
I handed him my copies of court documents and reference materials. While he read them, I went and poured us both a large shot of Irish whiskey on the rocks. What hurt him the most was reading the conversation in which Deborah frankly admitted to a mutual friend how her parents, sibling, and I had been so easily duped. It was a joint decision between Stephen and her that I would be the one to raise his children. From the first time I met Glenn, I knew he would do anything for me. He was so in love with me that he was willing to believe anything. His love made him so blind that he couldn't see what was right in front of him. Stephen, seeing Glenn's natural ability to notice the smallest details, made him his wand of choice on set. According to Steve, with Glenn's arrival, the cost of reshoots dropped by 80%. As a result, the company's reputation and profits skyrocketed. Glenn thought our home life was good. He never thought anything was wrong, and besides, he's a great father. When Terry, my youngest, graduates from high school, I will file for divorce and get him out of the picture. To do that, I'll use the escort services Stevens firm provides. The bastard won't even know it's over. It will be very easy to get as much out of him as possible, she said with a laugh. I returned and saw my father-in-law crying. Where did you get all this from? asked Carl seriously. I opened my laptop in front of him, went into my email and opened the latest email from Deborah's cell. I opened the video file and turned on its playback. Steve, this is frustrating as hell. I don't know how Glenn found out about this, said Deborah. He claims you're the children's father, but he hasn't shown us proof, so it's still the ramblings of his lawyer trying to build a case. What we're dealing with is just smoke and mirrors. Right, replied Steve. But Glenn resigned and served Robert on Saturday. Will he be serving corporate tomorrow? If so, that's when things will become clear. We're lucky the judge got off with a warning. Now I have to figure out what to tell the board of directors. I need to get my office, clothes, and personal belongings out of the house, so I'll be looking for a divorce lawyer tomorrow. Another thing I have to decide is what I'm going to tell my parents. Whatever I say, I have to make it seem like it's Glenn who's cheating, not me, and that you're just a friend helping me out. Do you think they'll buy that? asked Steve. After all, we both know your kids are mine. They have no reason to doubt me because they've never caught me doing anything, so their faith and trust in me is assured, she replied. If I have any doubts, I will start crying. My tears have always brought them to their senses. After all, I've always been daddy's little girl. What about our three children? Do you want them to take my last name after we get married? asked Stephen. Upon hearing this, I turned off the video because I almost cried. Deborah's diamond earrings have a camera built into them that charges wirelessly and transmits data over Wi-Fi when full. As long as they're charged and there's a signal, the information will be transmitted as long as she's wearing them, I said. Carla slipped inside and joined us. I offered her a glass of wine and when she accepted, I left them alone to discuss the situation. I returned just in time to see that Carl had replayed to her the conversation we had overheard. Carla's face spoke for itself. Mom said through tears. So what the divorce papers say is true. She cheated, but for how long? Longer than their marriage, Dad said. Our grandchildren were created by our daughter and Stephen. I've seen copies of the DNA report. My daughter Deborah is no longer in my eyes. She has turned her back on everything our family has ever stood for. I can't get over it because of the length of time and the amount of lies she spun. We can both see that she has no regrets about anything, not even being exposed. Makes me wonder how many times we've taken the kids away so she could be free to have fun with her real lover. But they're our grandchildren, Carla cried. I don't want to lose them. Mom, if I get custody of them, you'll always have unlimited access to them. I told Daddy that before we even started talking. I said to assuage her fears. But I suggest you both apply to the court for unlimited access to your grandchildren, regardless of who gets custody. You'll have to sue all three of us, but I think it's the wisest thing you can do. That way you can tell Deborah that until this is over, you refuse to take sides. Don't let your emotions make you close doors that can't be opened later. Carl looked at me and nodded in agreement. Honey, our son-in-law Glenn will always be family to me. I think his wisdom on this matter is correct. He is in as much pain as we are, and yet he puts our needs first, Carl said. As far as we know, it seems that she and her lover don't care about their children at all. Our daughter has been lying to us her entire adult life. Where did we go wrong? 
I want to ask, when Deborah confessed her love for Glenn to us, was she telling the truth? said Mom. Monday was a busy day for me. I drove my three children to school and then spent time in the office explaining the situation. If my wife tried to contact the kids at school, the police would find out. My soon-to-be ex found herself an expensive divorce attorney, and my former employer's firm was sued. On Wednesday, my father-in-law filed both Deborah and me. He told me that his daughter was furious and demanded that he withdraw his lawsuit. He told her that she and her mother didn't know what to believe, but felt that their relationship with their grandchildren should be protected. He asked her why she was denied access to the children. She refused to answer. Then he informed her that I had suggested that he make that decision after our family dinner on Sunday night. Now we know why you weren't invited. He made us promise that we would sue all of you because he didn't want our relationship with our grandchildren to suffer because of their parents' behavior. He's the one who gave us the address of your penthouse. That's how we knew where to sue you. According to city records, you are co-owners with Glenn's boss, which gives his claims more credibility. Deborah lost his temper and he hung up. This conversation told him a lot because, as human beings should, when confronted with the truth, most will run away. Fortunately, Friday was the last school day before spring break. So the in-laws, my three kids, my mom and I went to Disneyland for a week, leaving on Saturday and returning a week later. The trip had been planned weeks ago, but there was no way I could get a discount on Deborah's ticket. Gordon had gotten Deborah and her attorney to agree to sign a deed for her share of the house in lieu of her corporation paying a portion of the house expenses while we were married, and to make her believe that it would not be used as a marital asset in the divorce. She didn't realize that her corporation would be won because she ran it from home and its legal address was our residence. Walker's Human Resources Department accepted the terms of my termination. Thus, until my sick and vacation days were over, I remained an employee of the company. This gave me until the end of June to figure out what I wanted to do. When I returned from my former assistant, Nora, I learned that the board of directors had given me a chance to cool off before trying to work with me. They realized how valuable an employee I was to the firm and were getting messages from clients about whether or not I would return. Although the Walker brothers owned significant stakes in the corporation, they could both be removed for cause. In addition, the board of directors could force them to sell all of their stock. Therefore, the brothers hired an outside firm to analyze their options and deal with the consequences. Gordon allowed Deborah access to the garage where we moved all of her personal belongings after duplicating all of her corporation's business records, including all bank records, while we were gone. He had a team of forensic accountants analyze all of our children's parenting expenses to date, starting with the date of conception of the oldest. Using a semi-annual interest rate, he divided the cost of each year by three and calculated the cost of Steve Walker's involvement in my cuckoldry, doubling it for undue stress and suffering, then added interest to bring it to present value. The second lawsuit against him was for alienation of affection. I also sued both brothers for interference with the marital relationship. I used the adultery ground against my wife. The kids had just gotten home from school when there was a knock on our front door. It was a social worker checking out a complaint about me not watching the kids. I learned that the call came from my soon-to-be ex's attorney. My son led her into the kitchen where she caught me and my daughters working together to prepare dinner. She smelled a roast cooking in the oven. When she explained why she had come, I told her to rummage through the cabinets, refrigerator, and freezer while I continued peeling potatoes. After complying with the request, I offered her a cup of coffee and pulled out a couple large mugs. Miss, I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, I said. This is Trisha Marsh, Mr. James, she replied. I asked her to call me Glenn, and then suggested that if she had time, she should interview my children right now, since I assumed the court would order it. Since dinner will be ready in an hour, we'd be happy to have you join us if you can, she agreed. My son Carl led her into the den and they talked while Tina and Terry helped me. After a nice dinner, Trisha talked with my daughters for a long time afterward. Carl and I did the dishes together. None of the kids had done their homework and I had to write them notes explaining why if anyone asked. Finally, Trisha and I were able to talk privately. The first thing I did was show her Stephen and Deborah's chat room. For over 16 years, you never guessed anything, Trisha said. They had it all planned out. Apparently, she wanted kids and he didn't, so they picked you to raise his kids. That's roughly how I envision it. I said, makes me wonder if I even knew the woman I was married to. I'll add to my notes that the marriage itself was a lifetime of lies on her part. 
the fact that the two of them planned the whole thing together makes you question whether either of them even loved children, Trisha explained. They feel like the children and you are just an inconvenience to them that they have to circumvent. Your wife's lawyer is trying to give the impression that you don't care about your children. Everything I have seen and heard in the last few hours disproves that fact. I was surprised to hear that you revealed to them that Steve is their biological father. It's nice to see that all three have made it clear that they want to stay with you. Are you listed as the father on their birth certificates? Yes, I replied. Will that be important? Very. It proves that you didn't know and have been acting as if the children were yours all along. It will be important to the court when the custody issue is decided, Trisha said. I will give you my email address so you can send me that clip because the judge will have to see it. Seeing situations like yours makes me realize once again why I never got married. I can't change the past, I said with a smile. Besides, I love my children regardless of who created them. They may not have my genes, but everything else about them is me. I like the way you look at it, Trisha said. I'll have to investigate your soon-to-be ex's house and interview them both, but right now the deck is tipped in your favor. The judge will take that point into account, which I wrote down in my notes for the report. I wrote that Glenn Allen James was chosen by Deborah because he was good enough to be the father of her children, but not good enough for her to let him be a father. Mr. James obtained legal proof that Mrs. James was in a common-law relationship with Mr. Stephen Walker before and during their actual marriage. We chatted for another couple of hours, keeping things casual and promised to keep in touch, so we gave each other our cell phone numbers. It surprised her that Deborah had not contacted the children since the day of the application. She recorded this fact in her notes. I later learned that on the way home, she called a detective she knew to ask him if a crime had been committed. He said there had been, but he thought he should contact the prosecutor's office to see if they would be willing to prosecute. I was fortunate that the following year was an election year and the district attorney ran for office. At the time, I didn't yet realize how big a storm cloud my situation had created. Waking up Tuesday morning, I busied myself with getting the kids ready for school. I was surprised to read that Trisha wanted me to send the video clip I showed her to the ADA. I did better than that. I emailed him all the clips and told him I would send him the rest of what came in. It took about three hours before he got a response. I was surprised when he called and explained that he had a court order last night for wiretaps, etc. So what he got from me could be used legally in criminal court without revealing my name. A very important point was that all the clips I had came from an email address. This gave the impression that it was all coming from a third party. He was going to build a case to charge them both with extortion. One charge for each year they defrauded me and my children. I said I hoped the charges would be filed before I had to go to divorce court. When the kids got home, we ordered pizza and had an early dinner because I wanted to watch the local evening news. The local CBS affiliate showed everything. Deborah and Stephen were taken in for questioning as soon as they left the restaurant after dinner. For the next hour, I answered the phone and explained that I had no idea what was going on. The rest of the week went smoothly, so it seemed to me. I found out later that I was wrong. On Wednesday, I was seen entering the office building of a competitor of a former employer. No one knew I was meeting a friend for lunch. The next day, there was a mention in the gossip pages of the morning paper that I was negotiating with upper management to accept a position. I called the author of the article and told her that if she looked in the files again, she might have missed the name of the twin my wife was with when she was at the theater. Don't forget the words date night when you look at them. She asked how my date went. I replied that my attorney had recommended that I refrain from commenting at this time. Then things got interesting. I had driven the kids to school and had just returned to our family home on Friday morning when Deborah got out of the car and I prepared to pull in from the curb. She was dressed in a t-shirt and blue jeans. Her face looked sad and drained. She wore no makeup, which was surprising. She never went out anywhere without her eyes. Seeing her like that reminded me to check my new computer and see what the cameras had sent me. I walked to the curb. Glenn, Deborah said. My parents won't even talk to me. They told me not to contact them until this mess I made for myself is resolved. My siblings have told me the same thing. I want to be able to see my kids. Why? I asked. As far as I know, you didn't even call them? I called them that first Sunday. They all said they didn't want to talk to me and hung up. I guess they had cooled off by then, Deborah said. I have a lot of explaining to do.
I'll have my attorney talk to the judge and arrange for supervised visits. Nothing else, I said coldly. I will also inform him that you have violated the court order. Thank you, Deborah replied. You and I will have to sit down and talk things over. We don't have anything to talk about. We can irrefutably prove that the only reason you married me was because Stephen didn't want to step up to take responsibility as a man for raising his own children. As a result, you needed to find a sucker to take over. That's why you both chose me, I said sternly. Our entire marriage was a lie. It was meant to be. No man would ever do what you did out of love. How much have you both laughed at me? I suppose you are to be congratulated, since I heard that Steve and you are going to get married as soon as we are divorced. Not a single expression on her face changed during my entire tirade. Her response to my comments spoke volumes. We're not together. Steve had to find a new place to live. We were both served with a court order requiring us to have no contact with each other while being questioned by the detectives until they complete their investigation. For now, he had to move into a hotel, Deborah said. My lawyer messed it up when she filed a complaint against you with child services. They questioned us. The condo management is demanding that we sell the condo. The kids and I were interviewed on Monday, I explained. The interviewer interviewed us privately, so I have no idea what they told her. The children are of the age where the court will allow them to decide for themselves who they want to live with. They will be living with your parents this weekend. Without saying goodbye, I turned and walked back into the house. Grabbing my laptop, I headed to the kitchen. Brewing a new batch of coffee, I opened it up. I found out that a lot had happened since Monday. A human resources representative had used Roger's office to interview top-to-bottom management. It was sad to learn how many had laughed at me behind my back. Many were fired without explanation. For both my attorney and the prosecutor's office, this would have been a gold mine. It seems Stephen often used bribes, promotions, and blackmail to keep his relationship secret. All of this was a criminal offense. The board of directors and the CEO met late Thursday night after most of the employees had gone home. The board was fully briefed on who knew what, when it was done, and why it was done. Even former employees were interviewed. They discussed what should be done with Stephen and Robert. Stephen was finished as president of the firm, and Roger was to be forced out. The HR director told the CEO that I had been seen entering the commercial building and that according to her reliable sources, gossip columnists, I had been contacted by competitors. The CEO smiled and said, But can they offer him the position of president? The HR person picked up the phone and explained that she was on her way to see if Nora was still working. The CEO asked why. Nora was Glenn's assistant. She knows him better than anyone else. Thus, she can understand what he is thinking. Glenn? And then it hit me. Under state law, a civil relationship lasting more than a year was equivalent to marriage. I picked up the phone and called the DA's office. I explained my idea and he liked it. Legally, Deborah could be charged with bigamy as soon as they could prove their relationship. I gave them Gordon's office number and asked them to fax copies of everything we had. Two hours later, Gordon called. Damn it, Glenn. I didn't see this and I should have. This is great. Your divorce is a grand affair and Deborah will be indicted within hours. George Davidson, who is leading the DA's investigation into the two of them, said, You brought it up. I'm withdrawing your divorce case. Instead, we're filing for an annulment because legally she was already considered married. All that's left on my side is to work out the details, I said. Even that won't be difficult with Deborah in jail. Gordon laughed. It's funny how they've gotten away with all this scheming and planning for so long. Their own behavior is what incapacitates them and makes our other suits that much stronger. Speaking of which, wait until I email everything I have backed up. Call the DA's office and see if the wiretap authorization can be extended. If so, it will save me thousands of dollars, I said. Specify that the next letter from me will include evidence of criminal offenses. Maybe not, but I'm asking that she be ordered to foot your legal bill, Gordon replied. Glenn, are you serious? I've obtained copies of confessions from employees and former employees about what Steve did to keep his common-law marriage secret. I'll send them to you, said I. I went back to my laptop and opened a clip of the CEO, CFO, and the head of HR talking. They all agreed that my case was futile. They could try to defend against it, 
but the publicity and interest in it would destroy their credibility. They agreed that they should try to settle the case for as little money as possible. Within five minutes, the DA's office and my attorney forwarded to them all the emails I had received. My cell phone rang. It was Nora. Hi, stranger. Long time no see. How are you? I said. Glenn, everything is a mess. There hasn't been a department that hasn't been touched. In HR, everyone is being interviewed one-on-one. -on -one. They brought in a notary to witness and verify. We lost some good people. Some got fired, others left, Nora said. Steve and Robert were called in. After a meeting with the CEO, security let Steven clean off his desk and then escorted him out. Robert was told he was being stripped of all his duties until they decided his future. Is your job safe? I asked. I indicated in my resignation letter that you were the most qualified to take my position. That's what they told me. Right now I'm acting duties. No final decision will be made until the board finds a new president. The only thing they have told me is that the person they are interested in has a situation that needs to be resolved. My intuition tells me it's you. After all, Stephen or Robert never did anything unless they consulted you first. Well, they learned with great difficulty and expense that half the time they were heard but not listened to. I optimized by focusing on the important things, ignoring all the various bells and whistles that our customers often thought were important. When presented with the final product, they were happy with our results, I said. My phone has been busy since I left, but I'm not committing to anything for now. Thank you, Glenn. You told me what I needed to know without telling me anything specific. So you're still okay with coming back? said Nora. Depends, I laughed. You can send the Gossip Girl's email address, if you have one, from your personal account. No problem, but I'll send it to you from my cell phone, Nora replied. Using the email account, no one knew that I had sent the Gossip Girl all the videos that weren't part of my divorce case. Every little detail she could get out of them would be made public in print. Without naming names, she wrote in such a way that there was no doubt who she was addressing. The writer was a master of her craft. My son came running in from the living room while I was preparing for dinner. Dad, Mom, it's the early news. I walked in and scrolled back a page to see what was happening. She was being led away in handcuffs. On the next newscast, the spokesperson informed everyone that she was being charged with being married to two men at the same time in the eyes of the law. Can she go to jail on that charge if she is found guilty? asked Carl. Yes. It is considered a felony in this state. What kind of sentence she gets depends on the judge, I replied. My dad used to tell me, if you can't do time, don't do the crime. That stopped me from doing a lot of stupid things when I was your age. How long will they keep her, my son asked. Until she goes before a judge and can post bail, I answered. Depending on which ward she's in, she may already be released. Carl and Carla stopped by to pick up the kids. The boys would be going to the monster truck competition on Saturday morning. The girls had two soccer games coming up, and I needed to get out of the house. I can't believe it, Carl said. Deborah's been arrested on bigamy charges. She could get up to 10 years depending on the judge. I know, Dad, and it's going to get worse before it gets better, I replied. It seems her lover used bribes, threats, and blackmail to cover up their relationship. The DA's office got video evidence from those who were victimized by Steve. I felt sorry for Carl because his daughter must have been tearing his heart out. Suddenly, I was alone. I shouldn't have been because I was depressed mentally and emotionally. I thought this is what is called hitting rock bottom. I sat on the stairs and just cried and my body wouldn't let me stop. Some people say depression is a form of healing or coping. If it was healing, what is hell? The human body with its emotions is a fragile thing. No matter what we plan, we cannot control when or how it will find its release. Three hours later, I sat in a local park tossing unsalted peanuts to the squirrels, not knowing what to do. Many people don't realize how lonely divorce can be. Those you thought were friends are alienated to protect themselves. Others are alienated because they don't know what to believe. And then there's the new difference between being single and having all your friends married. Being single meant that in many situations you no longer fit in with society. I was lost in thought, completely oblivious to everything around me. I didn't see or hear the man who sat down on the other end of the bench. I saw you sitting there and I watched you for a while. 
It became painfully clear to me that squirrels seemed to have become your best friends. I wondered if it had gotten to you and how you were handling Glenn. I guess I found out, said Trisha Marsh. The blues suck, don't they? You've got to find your own way to get rid of them. Easier said than done. Divorce, as I've learned, is something you have to go through alone. Most of your friends avoid you like it's contagious, I replied. Come on, I'll buy you coffee, Trish said. No business talk, okay? I agreed. I found out that Trish was off to do her weekly shopping, so I joined her. It was interesting to learn her tastes in food. She bought mostly frozen fast food for herself because when she had no one to cook for, she lost interest. I knew this was the case with my mother. The problem was that their diet suffered along with it. I had my own shopping cart and she would see me pick up a few groceries. As we approached the deli counter, I asked the vendor for 12 fresh wontons and a quarter pound of roast duck. I hope you like wonton soup, I replied, because that's what I'll make for dinner if you agree. I don't mind since we're only a block or two from my apartment, Trish said. After washing the vegetables, she watched me cut them into equal portions. I told her I was using chicken broth because the wontons I'd gotten had more pork than beef in them. In the same manner, I chopped up the pre-prepared duck. She took out two pots. In one, I poured water and some salt, and in the other, I poured broth. Once the broth boiled, I added corn, water chestnut spices, and the duck. The red, yellow, and green peppers and snow peas I left for last. Once the salted water came to a boil, I added the wontons to it to boil. Before draining the water from the wontons, I added fresh vegetables to the soup and then topped the soup with two drops of soy sauce. After tasting it, I added some garlic powder. Finally, I added the wontons to the rest of the food and gave them time to absorb the flavor of the soup. Then I served it on the table. As soon as Trish tasted the first spoonful, she was already delighted. I had made enough for several bowls and figured she could heat up the leftovers. During our conversation, she learned that I prefer to make my wontons in large batches and freeze them. Another trick I explained was to use a little less broth and add cornstarch as a thickener to make the dish a stew that could be served over rice. When she found out how little I had spent, she was shocked. I left her house in a good mood. Trisha accepted me for who I was. Surprisingly, it was what I needed all along. Recognizing who you are helps you go a long way, and today it moved mountains. On Sunday, while reading the morning paper, I noticed a two-page story in Gossip Cop about the former president's ongoing efforts to maintain power and control over his personal situation. This included everything from promotions, blackmail, and bribery. At the end of the article, the question was asked, Is this being investigated? If not, why not? I texted Trish and asked if she wanted to go to Coney Island with me. She said yes. On our first date, we acted like teenagers. I asked her why she never got married. She explained that her career had always gotten in the way. And being called out too often was really messing up the relationship. I understood this from both sides because my career had affected me. My relatives and my children were surprised at my good mood when I met them for Sunday dinner. They all remarked that they hadn't seen me this happy in weeks. Monday morning, Nora called to let me know that I should expect a surprise visit from the chairman of the board of directors as they begin the dance to bring me back. An article that appeared in the Sunday paper made it happen because everyone knew who she was referring to. Nora informed me that the board was going to go to court to get a court order to force Steve and Robert to sell their shares as they were refusing to do so since they were no longer employed. Unexpected was a call from Deborah, who asked if we could meet privately in a neutral location with no cell phones. I asked her to give me 10 minutes to think about it and call her back. I called Gordon, who told me that sometimes the best place to have a private conversation is in the middle of a crowd where people can move around freely. I ended up meeting Deborah at the Nathan's hot dog stand in the park at one o'clock in the afternoon. We found a bench to sit on. We pulled out our cell phones and turned them off, leaving them in plain sight. What do you need, Deborah? I asked coldly. I need to know if you know who's doing this to Steve and me, Deborah said bluntly. Gossip Girl is pressuring the police, almost directing them. Stevens' corporation that he founded kicked him out. Robert thinks he was kicked out too, and now you filed for an annulment. Well, Stevens' problem comes from the board of directors, I believe. I have been informed that it is the source of the information the police get. Because of that, they have been able to discover facts and witnesses to events, I said. I can't discuss anything about our situation because my lawyer doesn't want me to.
Then why did you agree to meet with me? asked Debra. You know we have dug ourselves a huge hole. I was informed that Miss Marsh took her report to the court late last week. We were told that all the children want to stay with you. Given what Stephen and I are facing, I have to agree. Another lawyer says I'm facing a lot of jail time if the judge hearing the case agrees that, legally speaking, I was married to Stephen. In his opinion, it comes down to a matter of interpretation as to whether it is a marriage since he does not have a marriage certificate. I need to be able to tell my three children that I saw you today, I replied. They will be asking my opinion on how you look. How are they doing emotionally? asked Deborah with genuine concern. They have their moments. At times it's bad because I can't explain or answer their questions, I said. What questions? asked Deborah, looking for a way back into their lives. What did they do to deserve such a punishment? replied I. Even I've asked myself that question several times. You should write a book about being married to two men for almost 20 years. With that kind of interest, it will become a bestseller. With those words, I got up and left. Deborah was Deborah, always thinking of herself first. She was like an old dog that would never change. Worse, I couldn't feel sorry for her because I just realized that any emotion I had left was dead. When I got home, I checked my email and was surprised to find a video of me there. Deborah's voice in my chat sounded loud and clear. I forwarded it to the gossip columnist with a huge smile on my face. On Tuesday, the gossip column printed in bold print that bigamist Deborah James was going to write a book called Tell All about her 18 years as the wife of two men. This news made Carl and Carla Matthews even angrier because it appeared that their daughter was proud of what she had done. Gordon called me Wednesday night with good news. The day in divorce court had gone well. The judge agreed that in terms of state law, she was already married when we got married. Since we were not legally married, the annulment was granted. This gave him some leeway on the division of all assets. Although Deborah's attorney stubbornly resisted, the judge ruled that since she worked from home, Deborah's corporation should be considered a marital asset. He ruled a 65 to 35 split in my favor. Each would pay their own attorney fees. Deborah's attorney tried to convince him of a more equitable division. He replied that since her first husband was not listed in this divorce and he was involved in the scam, I would award Glenn James his share. I had to agree that we had hit her hard. I was granted temporary sole custody of the children until her criminal problems were resolved, but I had to allow her unrestricted access to her children. Stephen Walker was arrested Friday, and suddenly many people he had mistreated over the years found themselves in a legal situation requiring them to cooperate with the district attorney's office. Deborah's life was going downhill. Until a couple months ago, she had two lovers who kept her warm at night. Now she had none. I was busy working on the landscaping around the house when the chairman of the board showed up. We need to have a serious face-to-face -face talk about this mess, Glenn. I hope you've had plenty of time, said Bill Burroughs. I stood up and extended my hand to Bill and he took it. It wasn't about the firm, I said. It was all about the people who work in it. A huge smile appeared on his face. Thanks, that's just what I needed to hear. Let's see if we can work this out. We walked to my kitchen and started discussing my situation. I learned a few things and so did Bill. What struck me most was his honesty. He wasn't hiding anything. It was good to hear that after they filed a lawsuit to force them to sell their controlling interest, they agreed to exchange it from common stock to preferred stock. This move effectively took away their voting rights in the company. I told him that was one of my concerns. He analyzed each layoff one by one, explained the reasons, and talked about the people who had quit. I told him there were a few people I would like to try to rehire if I came back, because in a way they were in the same situation as me. You can't blame people for something they didn't know. I was caught off guard by the amount he offered on behalf of the firm to settle the lawsuit. I called Gordon, who talked to Bill. I told Gordon to go along with it. He then pulled out a contract to be president of the firm and held it out to me. I know you won't do anything until your lawyer gets his hands on the paycheck, Bill said. While you're waiting for it to be ready, review this. I think you'll be more than satisfied. When he left, I marveled at the time. We had talked for over three hours. I called Trisha, hoping she wasn't busy today. She wasn't busy. I asked her if she wanted to join my family for a holiday dinner. What are we celebrating? She asked. My divorce, getting custody, settling a lawsuit against my former employer, 
and my possible return to work. She agreed. I called the restaurant, which had a small private section, to see if it was free. It was free. I made reservations for 8 o'clock that evening. I called my in-laws, my mom, my sister, and her husband, and they all agreed to come. I told my sister to bring the kids. I called Trisha and let her know I would pick her up at 7. On the way, we stopped at Trisha's house so I could buy a mix of red and yellow roses with ferns in a charming vase. To thank her for all she had done. The rest of the drive, the kids teased me without malice for falling in love, discussing what they liked about her. I left the kids in the car and went up to her apartment myself when they let me in. Trisha loved the flowers and she looked amazing. Trisha Marsh was wearing a pretty yellow dress the color of early summer. Her blue eyes sparkled with wonder. She had prepared herself to make a good impression. And she did. Since you brought flowers, Trisha giggled, does that mean you consider this our first date? I didn't know what to say and stammered as I tried to speak. Trisha smiled and took my hand. It's been a while since I've made a man lose his breath, Trisha said with a smile. I'll take that as a yes. To this day, I can't forget that moment. We got in the car, the kids were gushing about me winning custody to her. I told her who else was coming to the party. Trisha replied, Wow, I'm meeting family on our first official date. Tammy, my oldest daughter, who took her maternal grandmother Carla's example, said she really liked the flowers my daddy bought for her. Trisha then showed her a picture of them, and it became her home screen. Due to traffic, we were 10 minutes late. I had pre-ordered two bottles of one of their best sellers, a medium champagne. Before I even started introductions, Terry, my youngest daughter, told me that this was Trisha Marsh, our father's girlfriend. Trisha and I burst into laughter. It set the mood for the whole evening. At dinner, I explained the court order and its rulings to everyone. Then, I talked about the pending settlement of the lawsuit against the firm and the fact that Robert and Stephen Walker had been removed from their management positions. The final piece of news was that I had been offered the position of president. Trisha explained that she was the social services representative called in to verify a complaint against me, and that's how we met. Carl stood up with champagne in his hand. After all you've been through, Glenn, Carl and I were afraid you would cut us out of your life. Instead, you made us closer. Congratulations, you're finally getting the respect you deserve. Here's to Glenn, for being who he is, and to Trisha for making him smile again. As we were all getting ready to leave, Carl pulled me aside and told me we were taking the kids for the weekend. We'll use our keys to stop by and pick up whatever we need. Don't waste time looking back. Start building your new life. I asked Trisha if she liked to dance and we hit the road. I dropped her off at 3 in the morning, having arranged to pick her up at noon. We ended up spending most of the weekend together. Monday morning after walking the kids to school, I took my first look at the offer. It was more than double my previous salary, gave built-in stock bonuses if certain conditions were met, and a signing bonus that gave me two options, cash or common stock. Bill had already signed it. I called the business attorney and made an appointment to go over all the legal terms and make sure I hadn't missed anything. At 10 in the morning, while I was doing laundry, there was a knock on my front door. When I opened the door, I was surprised to see a short, petite, oriental woman. My first thought was that the last thing I needed was Jehovah's Witness at my door. Her name was Lin Wong, better known as Gossip Girl. After introducing myself, I invited her in. Coffee or tea? I asked her. She replied, if you have a nice strong shot of gin, that would be fine. A little early for me, I thought, but that was okay. I brought her one and, being a gentleman, joined her, sipping my beer. Sorry to bother you, Mr. James, she said, but I want to show you the video. Telling her to go ahead, I found out that it was a conversation between Deborah and me. She then showed a conversation in which my wife claimed that she had never intended to write a book. She wanted a retraction so she could start an appeal in her divorce case. Mr. James, I need your perspective before I make a decision on what to do, explained Lin Wong. I asked her to turn on the recording equipment and let me know when I could start. She said, Mrs. Wong, first of all, you have permission to print my name. What you showed me is only part of our conversation that day. We discussed other things like our children and our divorce. In the 18 years of our marriage, we all realized that everything she told me was nothing more than lies. As a result of everything that has happened, I can't claim that everything she says is true, I explained. 
since everything she told me that I believed was a lie. I want to ask you, did she lie to you too? I can't say that she didn't lie, and that's what makes it sad in the first place. Since I wasn't worth being honest, I don't think she was worth lying to either. I hope this helps clear things up for you. She replied that yes, it would help, and turned off the device. I think I'll use my column to do a little survey. I'll write her conversation with me word for word. Underneath will be our conversation we just finished. I'll ask readers who they believe. I look forward to reading it, said I quite sincerely. My father had always believed that if you gave a man enough rope, sooner or later he would hang himself. Deborah was proving him right. For her, it was all about the money she was losing. I knew it. I think Mrs. Wong saw it too. My ex called and said she'd like to take our kids out to dinner. I said that they would all be home just after 4 p.m. and that she should come over then. She showed up shortly after that. The door was opened by my oldest daughter. I heard her yell out, Our ex-mother is here. But all I heard was the sound of running feet. I stayed where I was in the kitchen. I didn't want to be accused of interfering with my ex's relationship with our children. A few minutes later, I heard the front door close. Shortly afterward, my children walked in. We told her it's too soon, Daddy, Tammy said, because it is. We can't accept what she's done to all of us. That's what we told her. I said that if I did anything against a friend, Terry said, I'd probably lose his friendship for life, and you want us to go on with our lives like nothing happened. I just told her to go to hell, Carl said. She asked who gave you the right to say that. I told her my grandfather. To change the subject, I asked who wanted McDee's for dinner. Everyone agreed. After the kids did their homework, I called Trisha and explained what had happened. She said I shouldn't have been surprised. Even though you hit it well, they could see how hurt you were. It seems that Stevens' legal problems were getting to him. He told his legal team to settle as cheaply as possible. Robert resigned and decided to sue me for the damage I had done to his face. That Friday, after my attorney made some changes, I signed the contract and called Bill. We agreed to make an announcement the following Friday. I reported it to the Gossip Girl. My mother decided to take the kids for the weekend. Trisha was busy with another case. I spent my free time tracking down a few quitters. Two, whom I thought were key to my reorganization plans, agreed to return as soon as I showed them my new contract, stipulating that the head of human resources quit or be removed from his position. I learned that they had approached her to warn her about what Stephen was doing, but they were ignored. It was very amusing to read Mrs. Wong's comments. After she recounted word for word the conversations Deborah and I had, she asked readers for their thoughts. Then she wrote, Having met these two, she said, I had to wonder what Deborah even found in Glenn. He gives the impression of a kind, loving, and considerate man. The kind of man any woman would want to have. Deborah is a hunter, always seeking thrills and power from those with whom she can never find the happiness she craves. She will be what you want her to be because she doesn't know herself or feel comfortable in her own skin. She puts a mask on everyone she meets and it's not makeup on her face. Deborah James used Stephen Walker as much as he used her. That is what helped them keep their relationship alive. As I read this book, I thought it hit the spot. On Monday, I contacted a service that was looking for a housekeeper to work Monday through Friday. With my new salary level, I could afford it. I called the chairman of the board of directors and let him know what I had learned. When he found out they were telling the truth, she was let go. That night, talking to Trisha, I asked her if she knew anyone who burned out working in their field. She asked me why. I explained that I was looking for a human resources manager who had been laid off from the firm. She said she knew two people who were perfect for that field of work. I asked her to have them both contact me. On the morning of the last Friday in May, in front of the media, the chairman of the board introduced me as the new president. I told the media that we, as a company, had gone through a staffing crisis and were stepping up to the next level with a new team. I introduced the two new vice presidents, explaining that both of them resigned due to the behavior of the previous management team. I stated that from now on, we want all of our employees to have integrity and honesty. I introduced the new head of human resources, emphasizing that we were the first organization to hire a former social worker for this position because we wanted to develop moral and mental standards much higher than before. I asked Nora Richards, my former assistant, to stand up. We are very pleased to announce that Nora Richards has been appointed to the newly created position of vice president, 
handling all aspects of commercial production on our production team, I said. Nora was greeted with a round of applause. Thus, it was made clear that dedication and hard work meant something. Deborah fought the bigamy charge, lost, and is serving a sentence of two years minus one day. Stephen settled all lawsuits and is serving a 10-year sentence. Robert is appealing his defeat for the third time. Trisha Marsh and I continue to date, and the kids push us to set a wedding date. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.